Friends, can we say a very big thank you to Tom Zolka and Lady for what they've just said, outlining their struggle in the community and the vitality of all the services that we all depend on. And I want to say thank you to everyone that's organised this event today here in Harlow and to the Moot House Community Centre for welcoming us here this morning. It's a lovely venue and it's an example of what a good community can achieve and a good local authority can achieve in providing services for everybody. So thank you very much indeed for what you said this morning. Labour is standing up for communities across the country. The elections on the 5th of May give everyone in Britain a vote. In England, Wales and Scotland, the whole of the UK is voting. I'm the first Labour leader for 80 years, I'm not 80 years old, it's okay, <laughs> to have been a local councillor. I'm standing up for my community as a councillor, just as we as MPs have to stand up for the communities we represent. And it's great being here in Harlow launching today's election campaign. Bozen this town, me. this new town, was built by the vision of a post-war Labour government. They had a vision that they delivered on. The vision of the kind of town, community and housing balance they want. And a lot of the legacy of that period is still with us today. The National Health Service, the welfare state, council housing and other new towns like Harlow. And they did all that, that post-war Labour government, in the aftermath of total war, with the country truly and completely bankrupt. Now this Conservative government, this Tory government, tells us it can no longer afford nurses' bursaries, can no longer afford student grants, has no option but to impose the bedroom tax. The Conservative government is systematically making wrong choices and has absolutely the wrong priorities. I'll give you some examples. There's not time to give you all of them. <laughs> We'd be here for a very long time. In the last Parliament, they cut £4 billion from adult social care the budget that looks after the elderly people to remain in their homes. Yet found billions to give huge tax breaks to big corporations and the highest earners. Just last month in the budget they tried to take away up to £150 per week from people with disabilities to fund tax cuts for the very wealthiest. That's their priorities. This week, the publication of the Panama Papers drives home what more and more people feel. Quite simply, it's this. There's one rule for the rich and one rule for everybody else. And it's therefore high time, high time that we got tough on tax havens. Britain has a huge responsibility because many of those tax havens are in British overseas territories or Crown dependencies. The leaked documents show tax havens have become honeypots of international corruption, tax avoidance and tax evasion. They are sucking revenues out of our own country and many others, fueling inequality, shortchanging our services and our people. The government needs to go beyond warm words on tax dodging. There cannot be one set of tax rules for the wealthy elite and another for the rest of us. The unfairness and abuse must stop. So I say this to the government and to the Chancellor, no more lip service, the richest must pay their way. So instead of cutting Her Majesty's Revenue and Customs, the government must provide extra resources for the tax authorities to go after those, those who think they're above the law. It's simply unacceptable that while council budgets are cut, the services in which people rely on are being cut, the super rich elite dodge their taxes and flout the rules all over the world. The government cut flood defence funding, left the people unprotected in Yorkshire, Lancashire, Cumbria and other parts of the country last winter. They failed to take action in Europe against the dumping of cheap Chinese steel when other European countries were pushing for it, even when the US did. The government stood by as the steel crisis loomed. Communities in South Wales, Yorkshire 
and many other places are now paying the price for that failure. We massed over 150,000 signatures on a petition requesting the recall of Parliament to discuss the steel crisis. Sadly, parliamentary rules give that option to the Prime Minister. He refused to recall Parliament. By contrast, the Labour government in the Labour-dominated Assembly in Wales recalled the Assembly straight away. They are standing up for communities. What's wrong with the British government? They won't do the same. But this pressure is having some effect. Finally, the government is meeting with the trade unions representing thousands of workers whose jobs are now in the balance in an industry they've given their lives to. The government must ensure that their representatives, the trade union representatives, are part of any negotiation and assessment of bids for Tata Steel. These are people who've given their lives to the industry. Their voice and their intelligence must be part of the solution to the crisis. The government must ensure that Tata's customers, that existing contracts and supply will continue, whether it's in the private or the public sector. And now I want to offer to help David Cameron. I'm sure he's looking forward to it. <laughs> I make this offer. Once a rescue plan has been developed for UK Steel, we will help approaching the European Commission and anyone else necessary to ensure there are no obstacles to ensure that whatever agreement is finally reached to protect our steel industry is something that we can all see through. We need a steel industry in Britain and Labour is determined to ensure there is a steel industry in Britain. Quite, quite simply, this industry is too important to our manufacturing economy, the security of all of us, to fail. The government's ideological allergy to public ownership must not be allowed to prevent it taking the steps necessary to save UK steel. Now, being in opposition is never easy. I think we all know that. But Labour in Westminster has proved you can still have influence and you can still make a difference. It was by speaking out and standing up with people with disabilities that we shamed the government into abandoning their disgraceful cuts to personal independence payments. <laughs> but we're not done yet. We'll continue the campaign to stop the cuts to disabled people's ESA that there still is still there as a proposal in the budget. This week, around three million families, including thousands in Harlow, would have lost over a thousand pounds a year in working tax credits. But by campaigning around the country and by our votes in Parliament, Labour forced the Tories to scrap those cuts. They are not now going ahead. <laughs> and we continue to campaign to stop their cuts in universal credits. The cuts being inflicted on working families, disabled people and the failure to stand up for communities across Britain are a political choice, not an economic necessity. <laughs> By standing up, we can force this government back. And Labour is standing up. We're defending communities. We're working with people to defend communities. And there's a very big, urgent need for us to do so. The government is damaging the fabric of this country, our industries and our public services. In opposition, we forced the government to backtrack on uh, cuts to the police budgets. We had to stand up to prevent any more police officers being lost because there are now, as was pointed out earlier, 18,000 fewer police officers than there were six years ago. That's serious. The loss of community policing is serious for any community. There is a housing crisis, a housing crisis of supply and affordability. And again, as Laney pointed out, house building is its lowest level since the 1920s. And homelessness has risen every year that this government has been in office since 2010. I pay tribute to Harlow Council. It's building council housing for its communities. Well done, Harlow. Well done, those councils that are managing to build. I was in Bristol last week and I, many people I spoke to were quite shocked about what was happening to their city. 
Marvin Rees, the mayoral candidate for us there, and I met a lot of families who are living in the private rented sector. Their rents have gone up. They can't afford to pay those rents. They are being socially cleansed out of a community they've lived in for many, many years. The same is happening in city after city across Britain because it, we have a government that is not interested in regulation, not interested in the consequences of deregulation of the private rented sector. So we have to have a vision on housing and it's Labour that has that vision on housing. They want to sell off, we want to build. They want to decant, we want to keep communities together. There's a very big difference between those two philosophies. <laughs> this, the, schools budget, the schools budget is being cut for the first time since the 1990s. Class sizes are up, the teacher shortage is getting worse, and there is a crisis in many places of school places. Yet the Conservatives want to spend hundreds of millions of pounds on forcing all schools to become academies. That won't benefit a single child or train a single teacher. It won't ease the anguish of parents worried about school places. They're prepared to spend one billion pounds on forced academisation of every school shutting parents out of a say in the running of their schools when even their own conservative councillors don't want it. Teachers don't want it, parents don't want it, we don't want it, we are going to oppose it all the way. The National Health Service is our proudest creation. Health service free at the point of use as a human right for all. What an incredible achievement of that post-war Labour government. What a statement of our community of saying we will provide health care for all. But it's under threat like it's never been under threat before. The government failing to train enough nurses and now cutting bursaries that could train more. They've picked a wholly unnecessary fight with the brilliant junior doctors. They've, they've cut mental health budgets. The NHS has a record deficit and waiting times are rising. Here, the Princess Alexandra Hospital in Harlow is facing a huge deficit due to conservative failure on the NHS. We stand up for the NHS, the funding for all forms of care in the NHS, including mental health. That is the Labour way of doing things. And in terms of other areas of expenditure, they're cutting money for the arts, cutting money to local museums, cutting money to regional theatres. What is it with these Tories? They're creating cultural deserts in part of this country. It was Labour that founded the Arts Council. It was Labour that invested in theatre, in music for all, so that all of us can enjoy the arts and culture, which should be for everybody, not just for the few who can afford it. That's an important principle to me. Together, as a country, we need to stand up against the Conservatives' six-year record of mismanagement of the economy. Stand up for the vital services on which we all depend. David Cameron and George Osborne's policies aren't just deeply unfair. They failed. They failed on the deficit, failed on debt, failed on investment, failed on productivity, exports, growth and earning. Across the country, Labour councils are standing up, like here in Harlow. A million pounds has been invested in town centre regeneration. Electing a Labour council is the best protection for your community against the onslaught from this Conservative government. Because even in the toughest times, Labour councils are making better choices to support people. Introducing a genuine living wage to tackle low pay, dozens of Labour councils across the country are boosting wages for thousands of people by insisting that all council contractors pay the real living wage to their staff. Low pay, job insecurity holds people back, meaning too many families 
are struggling just to make ends meet every month. Here in Harlow, like many other Labour councils, they're building council houses for families that need a home. But all councils must be allowed and encouraged to do so on a much greater scale to deal with the housing crisis. What's the Tory response? What is the Tory response? To force councils to sell off council housing at a time when it's never been more precious or vital. And when our Labour MP, Theresa Pearce, one of our front bench spokespersons on housing, put actually a very simple amendment to the housing bill, all it asked was to ensure that any homes that were on the market for rent must be fit for human habitation. It's not a particularly big ask. <laughs> Too much for the Tories, they voted it down. How disgraceful is that? Labour in Harlow has invested as well. Bring street lighting back, turning it on overnight. The Tories in Essex apparently think Harlow should be kept in the dark. <laughs> we don't. Labour brings light to Harlow. <laughs> so, it's Labour that's standing up for communities. Every vote for Labour on May the 5th is a vote for a better way. It's a vote for dignity for people with disabilities. It's a vote against rising child poverty. It's a vote to protect the vital industries we've got in this country. It's a vote to stand against the super rich who are dodging their taxes as the Panama revelations have shown. A Labour vote is a vote for a party that believes the economy should work for everyone in every part of the country. Every vote for Labour this May is a vote to say it doesn't have to be like this. There is a better way. Labour is standing up to take that very positive message onto every doorstep across the whole country. Let May the 5th be the turning point when Labour grew Labour got support and Labour showed there is a different, much better way of running this country for the good of all, not just the benefit of the very few wealthy people that have had it too easy for too long. Thank you very much.